It is Tuesday. Welcome to the JB Font channel. I am your host, James Fontleroy. So good to see all of you here that are joining me on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon. Come on in, come on in. Have a seat, sit on down. We're going to have a conversation. So good to see all of you guys here with me today. The JB Font channel is available on all major podcast platforms. Go ahead and subscribe there. Also part of Revolutionary Blackout Network. So if you want to see me there, you can find me there on Sundays and Thursdays as well. If you guys have not already, you guys can go to jbfont.substack.com. This alerts you to email notifications so that whenever I go live, upload clips, or write articles, you guys also have that alert there because we all know that the algorithm, the YouTube algorithm, is just not as reliable. So it's best to get it straight from the horse's mouth, right? So go ahead and subscribe there also. If you guys have not already, go ahead and give the stream a like. This actually pushes me out as well into the algorithm. This helps so that I can get this message out to more people so that we can also better inform the people around us. So thank you so very much for that. Just as an aside to let you all know, if I'm sounding a little Steve Urkelish, if I'm sounding a little Fran Drescherish, or if I'm sounding a little, <laughs> oh my God, Chandler, it's because I'm under the weather. That's why. It's like if I'm sounding like Mr. Sheffield, that's why, okay? Because unfortunately, I got it from family. Thanks, Tyler. But I still love you. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, yeah, so I'm a little under the weather. If anybody can tell from the sound of my voice, uh, I I will promise I will try to be as clear as I possibly can. And yes, I do have a piping hot cup of tea for me. And plus, I just had a smoothie. The smoothie had um, I did strawberries, spinach, carrot. Uh, a little bit of celery, some hemp seed, flax seed. I ran out of chia seeds, so I won't be able to get any, any until tomorrow. I still have to get those. Um, and then I put a little bit of honey, and then I did some vegan protein powder. But yeah, and that's what I did. And so I had that about an hour ago. So I think that's one of the reasons why I'm actually feeling kind of uppity now. So that plus this tea, ready to go. So while that being said, I just want to say hello to everybody that's in the chat as well. Uh, my guest, Fiorella Isabel, will be here later in the hour. Uh, she has some things that come up, but she will be here in uh, about 45 minutes or so. But we're going to be covering, uh, we're going to say hello to everybody, and then we're going to cover our first story for today. And then when Fiorella gets in, we will get started with the interview. But while we're waiting, Let's say hello to each other. Uh, Media Dreams, I have your uh, your comments start because I will ask about that. Um, I won't do it in all caps, though, but, but I will ask uh, just to see what she says. But yes, I have it started just in case. So I have that there. We have Jacqueline coming in saying, hey, JB Font, eating my dinner at the moment, but I definitely won't be retiring at 65. My due date for retiring is the 9th of December, 2030, for my 67th birthday. Ooh. I have my opinions on retirement. And to be honest with you, I'll save it for later. But it's so good to see you, Jacqueline. We'll get into it. DBC voter says, yeah, JB, ask her nicely. CBC voter always coming in. Thank you so very much. All right. And yes, Media Dreams, I just addressed. Good to see you. Zavi coming in saying, hi, people excited for this interview. Good to see you, Zavi. Also, by the way, uh, I'll be on Zavi Benjamin's uh, channel. Uh, he will be interviewing me this evening at 7 p.m. on his channel here on YouTube. So if you guys would like, you guys can go over and just click on his uh, avatar there and you guys can get to his channel to see the interview for later this evening at 7 p.m. Eastern. OK, so good to see you, Zavi. 
You have Roger Meadows says, I was just thinking about fee yesterday. Also, Reagan in 1983 signed a bill into law that raised the retirement age to 67 for those born after 1959. Oh, yes, Reagan. Isn't, isn't Reagan the gift that keeps on giving? My sarcasm powers still remain, despite me sounding like Fran Drescher, but yeah. Game.film coming in and saying, JB and Fiorella, oh yeah, good to see you, game. If you guys have not, uh, you guys go ahead a uh, couple weeks back. It actually is already ha it's already that has been that long. But go back a couple of weeks. Uh, I actually had Game.film on, on the channel, and we covered some news stories as well. That was a really good conversation if you guys have not. So go ahead and uh, check that out. Uh, later as well. Terry Connolly's in, in here saying, fam, and hope get better soon. Thank you so, peace fam, and hope get hope you get better soon. Thank you so very much. All right. Roger Meadows says, Jay just called himself an uppity Negro. You're damn right I'm an uppity Negro. I don't care. You know what? I'm going to be uppity. Why? Because I am uppity for the simple fact that I believe that not only me, but everybody in this country, really in this world, deserve to have their material needs met. I am going to be uppity, not just for me, but I'm going to be uppity for you too. Because damn it, you deserve healthcare, housing, good food, clean water, a, a sustainable, clean planet. You deserve to have all that in a bag of properly sourced without the chemicals in it, Doritos. <laughs> but that's what you deserve. So, I, I, yes, am I an uppity Negro? You're damn right I am. So what? Thanks, Roger. <laughs> Bryce Smith is in the chat saying, sub JB, good to see you, Bryce. Okay, good to see all of you in here. Hang on, let me just... Maybe I've been sneezing like crazy. Oh my goodness! It has been a time. I've been making lots of noise in this in this room, and it's not the good kind of noise, if you know what I'm saying. But while we're saying, that, oh, by the way, let me check the Rockfin. Is anybody on Rockfin? Good to see you. Oh, Anna Mayor's on Rockfin. Says, "What's good, JB? What's good, Anna?" Good to see you on the rock. All right. So. Game.film says, Paul, like Paul Mooney used to say, I'm going to slice the pie. I want the fucking recipe. <laughs> that was me trying to do Paul Mooney. Uh, Roger Meadows says, all those things are not uppity. They're basics. We all should have. Matter of fact, they should be low bars, nor something we should aspire to. Agreed. Okay, what are we getting into today? This is going to be our story. So, so later in the show, we're going to be talking to Fiorella Isabel. This is going to be a great conversation. I cannot wait. I have a few questions. I want to get her perspective. You know, she's a journalist out there in, in Moscow. And so she has been her ears to the ground on many different uh, sides of different stories that has been going on here in the West, as well as what's been going on in the global South. So I cannot wait to get into that with her. But first, we're going to cover why your mama can't retire. Danger, boomers, danger. You are at risk of financial ruin simply because the capitalist system wants y'all to make bricks without straw. So this is what's going on right now. There has been an article that came out recently in the Orlando Sentinel talking about how older people are now returning to the workforce. Yes, older people, my mama, your mama, your grandma, your granddaddy, your grandpappy, your, your, your aunties, your uncles, they all going back into the workforce. Why? Because they can't afford to live. Let me ask you this. Is 
this sustainable? You guys already know the answer to that question. Go ahead and take the poll as well. I asked, I'm asking people if they will be able to retire by the age of 65 or not. Some people will say yes. Some people will say no. Some people will say, I don't know. I'm not sure. But go ahead and take the poll as well. We'll be getting into that. But one of the things I wanted to do was go into this article here. And then we'll actually go into a video as well. Because I think it's important that we, because a lot of times, one of the biggest issues that a lot of us tend to blame the boomer generation for our economic woes. But a lot of us, a lot of the boomers, it's really not their fault because they were just going by what the silent generation and the greatest generation were doing. Now, could they have changed things? Yes. That's why it's incumbent upon us to do the changing, right? But what about the silent generation? What about what about the greatest generation, right? What have they done as well? Now, this is not about generation blaming. But what I'm saying is, is that some of these generations thought that they were doing things better for their children. But in reality, it just led to a Pandora's box being opened. And so now a lot of us are suffering the older we get, or a lot of us are suffering at a younger age, the older we get. Things aren't progressing as well as they should have. Let me share this article out of your Orlando Sentinel. It says, older Floridians are going back to work as life gets less affordable. So, this came out earlier today. Says Larry Jessick couldn't hear his alarm, so it went off at 5 a.m. His wife nudged him awake. Half hour later, he was out the door, green polo tucked in, lunch cooler in hand. While neighbors slept, Jessick ambled to his car, guided by street lamps and moonlight. He is 77 years old, Vietnam veteran, and great grandfather to two. He is also part of the fast growing age group in the labor force, people 75 and older. So he went to work at Publix, says Americans are living longer and for some continuing to work in their later years is a practical choice made for the mental and social well-being. And I emphasize for some, I would argue very few now, says, but for many, like Jessic, it's also a matter of necessity. Seniors are seniors work because they have to afford medical bills, mortgages, food, and occasional pleasure. But because their fixed incomes and drained savings accounts are no longer enough to keep them afloat as the cost of groceries, homeowners association fees, and insurance rates soar. Because they're one crisis from financial disaster and fear they won't be able to afford assisted living if their health suddenly declines. So that's the point. Uh, that's the point when it comes to why they are no longer able to stay retired. Medical bills, mortgages, food, and the occasional pleasure. Now, you and I both know that the older you get, the more you need to go see the doctor. All right? Shout out to you, Sabiha. You see a lot of elderly people all the time. So therefore, of course, you know, there are some doctors uh, who are involved in, um, in end of life care. And so the older you get, the more you have to see because they have to make sure that, you know, you maintain that more razor's edge of living, right? And so a lot of older people thought in their mind, well, we have 
400, 500, 600, 700 thousand dollars left in, in retirement, we're good, right? We're gonna be golden. So by the time we hit 65, oh yeah, it's party time. Party time on the on the cruise ship. All right, let's get it on, right? We're gonna be listening to the Marvelettes and, 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 and the Temptations while you know we doing the conga, you know, while, on the cruise ship. Nah, <laughs> that's not the way it is now. It's not the way it is because ultimately, capitalism got this country, this world by the throat. And by doing so, Now they're suffering. The same system that they thought that was great for them in the 50s, especially with the expansion of the middle class, is now crunching them. The same system that they had clung to and said, oh my God, we were able to make you know good money. We were able to grow because we got hired by these capitalists and they were able to pay top dollar for our services and our goods. Now those same capitalists are saying, ha, 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 no, 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 no. We want all that money back. It's kind of interesting how a lot of boomers are now going back to the same circumstances that their parents were born in. Impoverished and... Uh, pinching pennies because the capitalists don't want to give them a damn thing, even though they're the ones who are making the capitalists rich. It's sad. It saddens me because boomers thought that they were going to be, because it was, it was always said that boomers, you know, did better than their parents' generation. But it ain't over until the fat lady sings. And the fat lady hasn't even sung one key yet. And now the boomers are actually starting to do worse. It's just sad. It makes me sad. But this is the reality of the situation. So it talks about how they bought a condo back in 2021. Uh, So here's the thing. It says, Larry has spent decades as an electrician. Joyce as a legal assistant. They had their ups and downs of money. They had paired, they had, the pair had reason that between Larry's military pension and Joyce's social security, they had enough to get by. For all intents and purposes, I mean, Larry basically did everything. Larry and Joyce basically did everything that they were supposed to do, right? He got into a profession. She was working as a legal assistant. They probably made decent money, right? It wasn't like crazy, but decent. And then on top of that, he got a military pension. And she got Social Security. They should be okay. They should be okay. But they're not. Why? And how many people do we know that are in their situation? Because for Joyce, 67, retirement meant an opportunity to reverse the back pain and general lethargy that had built over thousands of hours at, at a desk job. For Larry, who had grown up in Colorado Farm, it meant rest for his body, the first since adolescence. In retirement, Larry enjoyed golfing with neighbors. Okay, it talks about their personal story. But when they started to notice the pinch, it, it was here. It was first it was groceries, then car insurance, and then their condo association fees shot up to $949 a month. I'm sorry, but HOA fees at $949 a month? Who 
who in the hell's paying nine hundred forty nine dollars a month for HOA fees? Oh no, nah, baby. Uh uh-uh. uh. Y'all you, y'all ain't getting that much from me. You're not. No. And then I gotta pay my mortgage on top of that, or my rent on top of that. I wish I had some liquor in this. Mm-mm. Would you be? Would you pay nine hundred forty-nine dollars in HOA fees? Would you be cool with that? Oh my goodness. Huh. Has almost doubled the rate when they first moved in. Hell, I would have I would have scoffed at even if it was over four hundred dollars. I would have like hell no. Says replacing the aging appliances and installing hurricane windows to protect their home pushed them over the edge. Because when Joyce looked over their list of monthly expenses, reality sunk in. They couldn't make this last. Walk into any store, you'll see them. Older adults working the cash register at Walmart, sweeping the floor at Target, manning the paint counter at Lowe's. The number of seniors in the American workforce is growing at a rate greater than all other age groups combined. By 2030, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics report projects that near report pro, report projects that nearly 12% of people ages 75 and older will be working more than doubling the rate in 2000. Says one reason for the shift is simple. In the past, the window between retirement and death was shorter, maybe 15 years. Today, people who retire in their 60s may well live into their late 80s or 90s, so there's a need many to work longer. That's part of it. I would say that's part of it, but it's not all of it. And one thing that they are kind of alluded to, but was it didn't really put a pin on it, was that the greed of the corporations, the greed of the billionaires, has went far and above their expectations of how inflation would go. Because inflation is basically... The corporate dictators raising the prices because of their greed. That's all it really is. It's not, oh, it's just just the nature of the market. No, 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 no. It's because they just want more money. If you want to go down to the to the raw materials, the people who oversee the corporations for that that mine the raw materials, they're the ones who are raising the prices. And then everybody else down the line has to raise their prices too. All because they want more. So let's say hypothetically you are you are the CEO and you're the shareholders of Exxon. Well, guess what? You want more money because why? Because ultimately that's how capitalism works. Capitalism means you know infinite growth on a planet with finite resources. So you want that growth that year over year, that fiscal year, you want to make more last year in your dividends than you did the year prior. And so in order to do that, one of the things they have to do is raise up the prices. Well, if you're, say, a CEO of Exxon, then guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to raise those prices. Why? Because as a CEO, you have a fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders. With that being said, then the price goes up. Then guess what else goes up? All of your goods and services go up, meaning that the prices of food, uh, the prices of regular goods and services all go up exponentially because everybody else got to get theirs down the line too. Because capitalism is unsustainable. So that's what it is. And so because they're raising their prices, because they want to make more because of their greed, because they probably made just... You know, they probably did really decent the year before, and they can't keep keep it the same amount. No, 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 no. They got to raise it up. And so as they continuously raise it up, then that puts more of the squeeze. But sometimes they'll raise it up higher 
than they would in the typical trend. And so that's why we're feeling the squeeze even more than we thought. So that's why mama and daddy got to go back to work. Because ultimately, the shareholders have to get their dividends. Says, insufficient savings are another factor prompting older adults to keep working, says Laura Quimby, researcher at Boston College's Center for Retirement Research. Nearly 8% of Americans believe there is a retirement crisis. According to the a report released this year by the National Institute on Retirement Security. One and a half fear they won't be financially secure when they retire if the day ever comes. This is another variable. And this is one of the variables that people like my mother and many other people are going through. Is that there's a lot of older people who never truly got the chance to save up for retirement in the first place because of the system and how it treats workers. So you have a lot of older people that never even got a chance to true, truly retire. To truly be able to kick back. To truly be able to just live their life and just experience it. Now, it, it doesn't mean that they have all this, you know, this, you know, opulence and they have all this money saved up. It's like, no, they have enough, you know, to live you know, a somewhat kind of decent life. But even then, that is asking too much now. And they weren't able to save up for that. And so a lot of them never even got a chance to retire. Or even if they did, they just weren't able to save up enough. Or they had hard times in their 20s, 30s, and maybe even 40s. And they didn't even start, start saving up for retirement until they were like 50 years old. So that's the sad part. It talks about how they cannot afford, uh, uh, it says a lot of them cannot afford, well, a third of Americans can afford a $1,000 emergency without borrowing or taking on debt. talks about how uh, one of the biggest things is environmental factors, which says worsening storms have driven up insurance rates for homeowners and state legislation requiring condos to keep reserve funds for building repairs following Surfside collapse have contributed to the burden. Meanwhile, the influx of -of out-of-state residents saw housing prices soar. So another thing is, Climate change is causing your insurance rates to go up. Y'all care about climate change now? I just heard uh, Dr. Tom Terry, who is our meteorologist here in Central Florida and uh, WFTV, talking about how we're already experiencing activity in the tropics way earlier than anticipated. And it's going to be a stronger year for tropical storms, tropical depression, and hurricanes. You don't think that the insurance companies aren't looking at that and saying, uh-oh, we may need to hike up rates even more. So if you own a home, those insurance rates are going to go up even more because you live in a peninsula surrounded by water in Hurricane Alley. So this also affects people who are older, who are retired, who didn't think that their insurance rates would start keep bumping up as this goes on. So I just want to share this as well, because I think this is interesting. (laughs) 
says though Joyce has always been budget conscious, a previous marriage and divorce set her back too. So you never think about all these things that happen in your life before you retire. And then one of the things she talks about here is that they're not able to spend the quality time together that they wanted to when they were initially retired. It says these days, more than anything, Joyce and Larry miss quality time together. They yearn to be out in the world, eating pizza on the sand at Gulfport and watching $5 movie matinees. But weekdays are exhausting. By the time they make it to the end of the workday, they often opt to sit and rest at home. Why? Because the shareholders got to get theirs. They don't care about the older people. which means that instead of actually enjoying their life, they don't really get a chance. That means their life is really essentially not theirs, not theirs to live. My mother is 72. She's trying to go back to work. Do you think that I want my mother to go back to work? Nope. She's a great grandma. She should be, you know, out living, spending time with her great grandson, chilling out with her grandkids, right? She should be going to brunch. I want my mother to go to brunch and have quiche, right? But she can't. Because the shareholders got to get theirs. I have this uh, video that I want to share as well. And it's quite interesting. I would like for you guys to see this because it really puts into reality what a lot of our older people are going through as well as what we are looking forward to if we do not change this system. Let's go. We want to keep talking about this because it's become a reality for many of a certain age. Teresa Gillarducci is a labor economist. She's published works in several journals and co-authored uh, books, including her most recent, Rescuing Retirement. Teresa, good morning to you. Now, we're seeing these retirees return uh, because I'm sure a lot of them are very fearful of the volatile economy. But what are some of the other reasons impacting them? I would think socialization could be a, another reason. Oh, yeah, sure, Adrian. Uh, well, that story was really heartbreaking, um, but it's actually the motivation for my work. Um, we are, I, I'm expecting a lot of um, retirees are going to be looking for work. I was really glad um, that the person you profiled actually got a job. Um, they'll be coming back to work because of inflation, but also because their income did not keep up with what they thought they, they needed. Um, and worse, during the pandemic, millions of older workers were pushed out before they were ready. Uh. So what that means is that they expected to accumulate more pensions. They expected to not dip into their pension plans. They expected not to go into debt. And because of that massive unemployment during the pandemic, I expect that if they... Um, are welcome back to the labor force, they will try to come back. Well so there was another variable that they weren't thinking about. The pandemic hit, and then next thing you know, it was just like, oh. And when something like that happens, who are typically the first to go? The first to go are two different types of people, either the people who are who just got there or people who are set to leave in a little bit. But they're like, nah, you got to go quicker. And so that's what happened. Let's say you were due to retire in like five years, right? 
Now, say let's say you were due to retire in three years. Then the pandemic hits. Guess what? Oh, yeah, we cut that three years short. But I won't earn enough for my pension. Sorry, too bad, so sad, bye-bye. Now, look. They had the, they were forced to retire. That's another variable a lot of people don't think about. And on top of that, you have a lot of them that didn't save up enough. They couldn't save up enough. And you also got to remember some of these same older people also had to suffer through the 2008 crisis. Some of them lost their housing back in 2008. And guess what? That is wealth that they lost. So that was 15, 16 years ago. That wasn't that long. So 15, 16 years ago, they suffered a housing crash, right? Went through a, a, a major recession. Then on top of it, you went through uh, the pandemic. And now look at it, the inflation crisis, and I call it a crisis that is caused by the corporate dictators that is now forcing them back into the war workforce. So they be, so people, particularly boomers, have been getting it left and right, right before they say peace out to the workforce. You um, say it like it's a question, though. Other, you say yeah, it like yeah, if, if they're what? I will. I totally will um, answer that question about whether or not older workers are coming back to work because somehow retirement was unsatisfying. I'm not seeing any evidence for that. When people retire and they have enough money, they are usually happier than they thought they would be. This is something that grinds my gears and I cannot stand. Here's one of my biggest issues. The people who go, oh, well, they just want to go back to work because they just want to be around people. They just want to go back to work because they want to feel productive again. They retired for a reason, boo. If they wanted to stay, they would have stayed. But no, they retired because they actually wanted to get out of the workforce. People don't have retirement parties just to suddenly turn around and go, well, you know what? I just, I couldn't help myself. I got to go back out there. No. Are you crazy? Wait. Are you nuts? My God, people do not go back into the workforce simply because they just want to be around people. No. That is far and few in between. What in the world is this like? What in tarnation is this lady talking about? I'm not not this lady, but the interviewer. Let let let's let this lady break it down because she breaks it down so beautifully. They find that they structured their time with activities they like to do with mainly friends, with family, with doctor's appointments, or with travel or just sitting around thinking about what they can do and be when they can control the, the pace and content of their time. So going back to work to socialize, no thank you. They can find other ways to socialize. There you have it. There you go. They don't want to go back to work to socialize. They don't want to start socializing, y'all. They don't want to, look, look, let me ask you this question. Do you like to go to work to socialize? Exactly, exactly. So if you don't like it, then guess what? Sure as hell, grandmama don't like to go back to work to socialize either. If you can't stand them, they can't stand them. The feeling is mutual woe. So why in the world are we saying, oh, they just want to go because they want to socialize? No, they don't. 
Do you know who? Do you know who this generation is? This is the generation that went to the juke joints. This is the generation that used to dance. You know, they used to do the bump. Uh, uh. Like they, they were so they been, they stayed socializing. They were doing they were doing it all, baby. The, this is the the Woodstock generation. Baby, they do enough socializing as it is. Do you did you know that the rate of of STIs exploded among elderly people? They they good on the socialization part. They good on socializing. They're not they're not doing that to go back go back to work because of that. And a lot of them they're getting it in. But that's the thing. Like we They do not need to go back for that. Sorry. Well, do you think that they have bargaining power? I mean, we're still seeing so many people leave the industry. We're seeing so many hiring shortages all across industries. Exactly. And so when they're coming back, do they have yeah. the chance to negotiate a reasonable pay? Yeah, that, I really looked into that. When, when they come back, are they going to have the kind of bargaining power we're seeing among leisure and hospitality workers, because those wages are going up, or the Amazon workers and, and Starbucks workers who are union, who are organizing. Well, yes and no. The Amazon uh, warehousing is an old person's job. A lot of retirees, we saw an award-winning film, um, um, you know, win the Best Picture Award um, in 2020 about older workers working in Amazon warehouses. So if they unionize, great, bargaining power. Starbucks workers, hotel workers, those are young people's job and, and older workers not gonna have bargaining power there. A lot of older workers, especially women, go into home health and personal um, care. They're old women taking care of even older women. Um, and if those um, occupations unionize, some of the lowest paid occupations in the country, um, then they will get bargaining power. But just the supply and demand dynamics on their end, I, I wouldn't count on it. What we so one of the things that this shows to me is just because you have experience that's not everything you can say well i had this many ex this many years experience you know that should put me as a shoe in nah <laughs> no it's not that way anymore it's kind of sad but it's not just because you have all that experience Yeah, nah. it makes me feel bad, but that's the way it is. So let's finish this. We see wage growth among older workers is actually much lower than for younger workers. What's some advice that you would give to somebody who has yeah. to uh, make that step back into the workforce when they thought they were kind of yeah. wrapped up with it? Yeah, I um, um, try to actually go into a job that's unionizing. <laughs> um, you know, if you're going to go to a Starbucks store, pick one that is um, organizing. Um, go to home health care and personal care that um, is um, not just a private firm, um, but is one of those places where the state or the city pay for it. Um, really know your rights and don't self-deprecate because you're old. You know, don't mm -hmm. make those old person's jokes. Don't mm -hmm. make any of those. Um, and then get some help from any kind of local AERP uh, about how to build your confidence and get whatever individual bargaining power you can get. You know, I see a silver lining here. I really do. I think that it's quite possible that because we need workers so badly that we might start to actually honor our seniors again, our elders again, in a way that we have not really done in the past few years. Hold on. Wait a minute. Hold up. If we actually honored our seniors, if we actually gave more respect to our seniors, we would not have to force them out of retirement in the first place. What is this lady saying? Madam, are you kidding me right now? Oh, well, we'll respect them more because we see them out in the workforce. No, 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 no. If we actually have more respect for them, then we wouldn't be forcing them to have to leave retirement at their elderly age. In fact, more respect for them means that you actually see them as let them live their lives with what time they have left.
but they're not wanting to do that because guess what? The corporate dictators don't have any honor or respect for those who are older among us. If they did, then they would be trying to lower the retirement age. That's right, lower it. And the goal was really to allow people to live their lives without having to waste it away for these corporate dictators. That's the implementation of Social Security. But now they can't do it. And so whatever this lady is saying, I, I, I'm sorry, ma'am, but no, if that's not going to cause more respect. And then on top of it, you have a lot of Gen X and millennial workers that are going to start resenting older workers because now they're taking the jobs that they would uh, you know, otherwise get. But now there's almost like a fight between you know, boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. Because remember, Gen Z aren't little kids anymore. Gen Zs are now starting to have their own kids. So I think that's important. <sighs> yeah, and that, that honoring that dignity doesn't usually come from outside. It has to come from mobilization of older workers and our support of them. Yeah. So I hope so too. All right, Teresa Gillarducci, thank you so much. So yes, unfortunately, that's what's going on within our older workers. So what is the solution for something like that? One of the solutions that I offer is, you know how we talk about building mutual aid? We talk about building dual power. This also will help and assist our older people because if we're trying to build mutual aid and dual power, this allows them to be able to live out their lives. We can change this system in fundamental ways so that they can be able to actually have something better for themselves, at least for the, the for the remainder of their lives, you know, while we change the system. I, I just, I feel for a lot of older people, especially boomers. And now Gen X is coming up behind them. You know, is Gen X going to be able to do the same thing? Uh, this is why, you know, pushing for Things, you know, like building mutual aid, building dual power, or even things like um, the citizen ballot initiatives, you know, for our seniors, that also would be a great thing. So let's focus on using the power that we have so that we can actually make better changes for them. And then that will in turn put better changes for ourselves too. All right. So uh, go ahead and give the stream a like. Thank you so very much to everybody, uh, and we are ready to go. I will be doing the comments for this segment a little bit afterwards, but Fiorella, if you are ready, then please give me a thumbs up. All right. So I have with me today my guest, Fiorella Isabel. She is a journalist and political commentator, and I love, I'm loving the jacket, by the way, but good to see you as well it's here today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah. So last time we talked, we talked about, you know, your your uh, development and how you got to where you're at today as far as your journalism. And now I just want to get into the things that are going on and your thoughts about what's going on from your perspective. Uh, one of the things that I actually wanted to start off with was that you now live in Moscow. And Russia just recently had its recent elections. I wanted to get your, your perspective of the differences you noticed there that you haven't seen in the United States, if you can give us that kind of perspective from 30,000 feet. Right. So uh, the elections here are, they have similarities and differences. Uh, the similarities, I would say, is there is more than one day. Um, this is just new. Uh, it didn't, they didn't do this before. They had uh, some time to vote uh, via online, um, but it was in, done entirely with a blockchain-based type of, of uh, electronic system, which is uh, very difficult to hack. 
I'm not saying any internet system is, isn't uh, open to hacking. It is, but this particular system is like a blockchain based type of system. Also they use uh, actual Russian hackers themselves to kind of oversee, but you have to sign up ahead of time. If you want to vote uh, online from home, you can also sign up to vote in the, in Moscow particularly, which is the capital. You can use the, uh, a new electronic voting system, which is basically, it's the same thing we see in California. It's just a computer or in, in other places. Now you go and you pick your choice for president and you um, get a confirmation that your vote has been counted. And then you, you show up at the polling station. You do need an ID. You do need a, um, it's a passport. They have their ID is a Russian passport, which they can use to travel anyway inside of russia anywhere because it's huge russia is huge so they use a passport they don't use like a uh, driver's license id that's a separate thing um so you need that and they look you up on the database and then you go in or if you wanted to use pen and paper you also have that option of doing that and then the votes are tallied immediately and you get a result the official uh they're tallied immediately but the official result might take a few days but uh, they'll t announce a winner, which is what happened. And so a lot of people have questioned Russia's elections, um, especially in the United States. They said, oh, you know, Putin, he's a dictator. He's being reelected all the time. But I have to remind everybody that in the United States, we didn't have term limits for the presidency. FDR would have kept winning. And that's why they put in these term limits. Now, you can argue that it's good, that it's bad. But what I can say is that a lot of socialist and communist countries don't have term limits. Um, and in a way, it's worked to their benefit because I would say that, for example, if you're a country like Cuba that has had had a popular leader in Fidel Castro, he was getting reelected by popularity. You have the vulnerability of having a Western-backed candidate try to come in and and or be influenced uh, a candidate be influenced by the west and try to overthrow the government the same thing we saw in russia via navalny and those attempts to try to uh fund navalny directly from the state department and the intelligence apparatus receive funding to try to overthrow the government of russia we've seen this in nicaragua as well where i've been several times and uh, daniel ortega keeps getting reelected which is why they say he's a dictator, but he keeps winning. And again, they go after candidates who are funded directly by the United States, which the United States would do as well. We have the Uhuru movement, the Uhuru group getting a uh, jail time because somebody allegedly, right, because of uh, many allegations, but among them is that they had ties to Russia. So these are excuses. And what I saw, especially in the new territories, in the Donbass, uh, in Lugansk, in, in Donetsk, um, and in other territories, you basically saw Putin win by a higher margin. He won by 87% of the vote. But what's important to note here isn't how high he won by, but how many people actually participate overall in the country. It was close to 70% of the population participated in the elections we don't have those numbers we can only dream of those numbers so that tells you uh how involved people are in their political process of course they're going through a war issue right now which i think will ramp up participation one way or another but in but it is also the fact that in the territories, for example, where you vote by pen and paper, they don't have any of the machines there. Uh, Putin won by a larger number. He won by in the 90s of the percentage wise, which is why so many people try to question the elections the same way they did with uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, that there's no way this could be a possibility. Now, even if you did believe that, first of all, it's none of the United States' business when we have dismal elections and the public has uh, in the United States lost the confidence in elections, understandably so. We keep third parties out. We have a two-party system, which we know is two wings of the same bird. We don't have an ability to have a, a viable third-party option or viable independent options. There are like several parties in Russia, and there's a communist party, and the communist party is the second 
uh, largest party. It is the most, it's the second most powerful. And uh, the current president, Putin, is not part of any party at the moment. Uh, he left the party that he was in. So technically, Russia has a, per a president that is independent of any party, which is really interesting and something that would be unheard of in the United States. So, yeah, there are similarities, but there are obviously many differences. And I, I like the difference that in spite of, you know, there's new parties coming in and different things going on, that the Communist Party is still a substantial influence uh, in Russia. And, um, and the communist party is the one that actually wanted to go into Donbass earlier to protect this, the Russian ethnic, uh, citizens that were getting killed by actual neo-Nazis. And, um, you know, that, that was something that I think a lot of people, uh, don't really know about. And yeah, yeah I mean, it, it was pretty good, interesting to see the different dynamics. Yeah. And, and just to point out what you were saying earlier, I want to show the electoral college maps of two uh, presidents. So, because uh, everybody talks about, oh my gosh, well, if somebody sweeps that much of the electorate, it is, you know, uh, it, it's got to be a dictatorship. Was it a dictatorship when Ronald Reagan won in 1980? Was that a dictatorship? I don't think so, but. <laughs> I mean, because it could be. Yeah. Are you? I mean, look at look at that sea of red, right? Um, you know, you since you brought this up, votes. I, I just want to point something out, too. Since you brought this up, uh, this is debatable for people, the Electoral College issue. In mm -hmm. Russia, they have direct uh, voting. So you vote, your vote counts for or against a, a candidate, whatever that candidate is, right? Um, in the United States, we have the Electoral College. We elect delegates and superdelegates. And that... Yeah is not direct democracy. And that also diminishes our uh, ability to have a say in who is elected. So that's a, another huge difference because we don't feel like our vote counts. We've seen what happened with Bernie Sanders in 2016 with Hillary Clinton. We've seen everything that happened after that in the last two elections and the way that the third parties have just been completely pushed away. It just shows that we don't really have the ability to choose the president. We see, we saw what Barack Obama did as well in 2020 um, in asking all of the other candidates to drop out. And we don't have a candidate at this point in uh, the Democratic Party that ran as a Democrat that is actually fighting for people. And you could even say that the third party candidates are also weak. And I know you wanted to talk about them as well. But for me, it's like, I'm not at the point where I believe electoralism is going to save the United States. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not going to hold out, hold it against people like, you know, my, my co-host Pasta, who says, well, we need to vote. We can't let it take them take that away from us. We need to support other candidates. But look, I, for me, it's, it, it, I don't see that, that we have fair elections. They're not going to let somebody that's going to challenge the establishment in, in any way, shape or form. I think the power has to come through, uh, outside means through a, a peop the people demanding it. And I think the United States is headed in that direction, unfortunately, because, of the uh the fall that we're experiencing in the united states yeah yeah that's true and just wanted to share this as well this is just the other side of the spectrum that a lot of people don't think about uh so of course i shared uh it was ronald reagan in 1980 this is the 1932 election for franklin roosevelt look at how much he won uh, and this is just swings in the, uh, the complete opposite direction. So when people talk about, oh, my God, somebody like Vladimir Putin winning that much of the vote, it's like it's not out of the realm of possibility that people actually just like the leader that they already have. Right. Yeah, it's not. And I just want to say uh, also, Putin, uh, he when he came into power, Russia was uh, really in a different state. And I have friends who have come back to Russia after leaving when they left like at five or six years old and they've returned and they are like, wow, this is a completely different country. Not saying he did this all on his own, but a lot of people here view him as somebody that tried to, uh, did the best he could in terms of modernizing Russia, 
to what it where, what it is today. And one of the things that people don't like to talk about is that Russia still has many elements of the Soviet Union that make it a successful country, at least right now on the rise. You have the uh, university that's a practically free. Uh, people don't go in debt for that. You have people that home uh, own homes, home ownership is high. Why? Because of Soviet Union, uh, because people were given homes and they have passed down these homes from generations. Most people I know who are from Russia do not pay rent. They don't have to if they don't want to. And that is something that I think gives people the freedom to not have debt. Credit borrowing is not as common here as well as it is in the United States because people live within their means as well. Now, the, the issue of transportation, there are trains who built them. Stalin and um, these the train system was is, is so effective here in Moscow it, all over Russia in general they have a wonderful train system but it is ex most effective in Moscow it is clean it is efficient if you miss a train less than a minute later 30 seconds to 45 seconds later there's another one coming and that's how it works and you can get around via taxi there's bicycles there's scooters all these things yeah but the train system the subway the metro is the most effective and then you have healthcare if uh you don't have a job the state pays for your health if you uh have a job your employer pays you don't get it taken out of your paycheck your employer pays your health care. And if you, uh, for example, want a different doctor that's not in your uh, health care system, you're not refused treatment. You simply pay more of a, of a fee uh, if you want a different doctor, but it's not like it's that much. And so I, I really, you know, I had a friend who had a health issue and they took the ambulance and the ambulance was completely free. This is something that's a luxury in the United States where we all, our people are taking Ubers because they don't want to pay the $10,000 it costs to get an ambulance. And I know you know this because you have a health issue. And yeah. this is something that you would think, wow, if a country that we are told is a gas station with nuclear weapons, it's so backward and there's a dictatorship and all of these things. Well, they have health care. They have, uh, you know, uh, education. They have public transportation. These are things, basic things that we don't have in the United States, so it's the, the greatest country in the world. So why is that possible then for Russia, who came from the Cold War, who came after the fall of the Soviet Union and was in a very dire position to achieve that in a matter of decades, whereas we are just losing. We, our infrastructure is crumbling. The trains are derailing. The, everything is, is getting blown up. We are seeing the, the bridges fall, right? And and this is this is just a, a symbolic. I don't think it's there's a conspiracy behind the bridge, by the way. I think it just everything is is makes itself go uh, in a more chaotic manner because our infrastructure is already bad to begin with. So everything is just sort of falling apart. Yeah, and, and I, just just to uh, kind of put a pin on what you said, because I, I wasn't expecting to go into this direction, but I, I'm actually very interested in this. It sounds like Russia is more of that thriving social democracy that a lot of progressives actually champion but they never ever talk about Russia, right? Right. Yeah, and it's because you know uh, they're they're more uh, conservative in in some social aspects. For example, drugs here are not legal uh, in terms of marijuana and such. And like you know, the younger populations don't agree with that. This is something that Russia is going to have to grapple with. But what I go back to is you know that's their prerogative. That's up for the people of Russia to decide. For the people of Russia to to decide what things will look like going forward. It is still not a country, though, uh, for example, that is ruled by a religion. Uh, there is like a strong uh, sentiment of uh, or orthodoxy, Russian Orthodox Church, but it's not like you sit there and have to pray at, at any school or anything. And in fact, most people don't even go to church. It's just a sector of the population. And so when you hear um, that, you know, Russia is just super conservative. It's crazy. I think, I think that's just the older, maybe certain sectors of the population. Um, if you recall during the, the Soviet Union, 
they weren't fond of the church either. So there's kind of those different elements that all exist there. And I think that's going to be something that they'll develop to their own pace. We can't be here and dictate, you know, in the United States, say we need Russia to be this and that, while we, our president and our military and our entire government is supporting genocide in Gaza. So I, again, there's just different elements that are used to try to, you know, d dismiss uh, Russia as a country, you know, I'm not saying I agree with everything that every single Russian politician says or does, but what I do think is that they are a sovereign country and a sovereign people, and they have the right to decide for themselves what, what they should or shouldn't do. And I would say that Russia is kind of behind on these social issues in terms of like where we were a few decades ago, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to push our our, our own beliefs on that. And that's kind of how I look at it. Like, okay, I see, I see where, you know, the economics of things is strong. Uh, I see that there's a lot of those values that remain from the Soviet Union, what you call, you know, social democracy, because Russia is a capitalist country. There is capitalism, but there are also a lot of things controlled by the state, which is still uh, a Soviet type of structure. So there's an interesting mixture there. And I would say it's, a mixed type of economy with uh, social safety nets uh, that uh, far exceed what we have in the United States. Understood. Thank you so very much. Now, I, my next question I wanted to ask you, and sorry, I deviated a little bit, but that was just some interesting information that you were giving. But my next question is, we now have basically a rematch of Donald Trump and Joe Biden, which many people's eyes are on. But recently, RFK Jr. announced his VP, who was for all intents and purposes, a Democrat, a wealthy Democrat. Now, her name is Nicole Shanahan. What are your thoughts on this pick? And are the optics looking favorable or unfavorable for RFK Jr.? Well, um, I think the optics have been unfavorable for him since he went on a rampage and supporting Israel and hanging out with Rabbi Shmuley and pretty much saying how, you know, he thinks Palestinians and Hamas, in the, the same type of rhetoric that we see coming from the U.S. State Department, from Zionists. So that was a one, one thing that I think the most really undid his campaign for a lot of people. The second thing is picking a VP that is an unknown and is a Democrat is not going to really uh, play up to the branding he put out as being an anti-establishment independent candidate. Because his foreign policy, beside what he says about Ukraine, which he says he would, you know, end the war in Ukraine and all, all of that mm -hmm. is still pro-Zionist, is still going to push buttons with Iran and the Middle East. He's pretty much uh, terrible on immigration in, in Latin America. Once again, using the whole same trope of, you know, the invasion of, of, of cartels and that sort of thing. And so foreign policy wise, he seems to be right on the track with Democrats. And then he puts in a VP that has no experience, doesn't have any name recognition, which is superficial, but it matters when you look at the election uh, pr process. And she, um, is extremely wealthy. So that doesn't signal to people that he's going to try to go outside of the establishment. And let's be honest, RFK comes from the establishment. He has uh, Hollywood and CIA connections within his family, within, uh, I think, his daughter-in-law uh, as well. And at the end of the day, you know, I think he's trying to get in there whatever way he can, but I, I don't see how that is a viable option if you're really trying to shake things up and people can say, well, he's scared. He's scared of the Israeli lobby. He's scared of APAC. He's scared that he will be assassinated like his father and his uncle. Well, okay. But again, then if, if you're scared and I mean, understandably you might be um, in U S politics as to what could potentially happen, you shouldn't be in politics because otherwise you're just making people lose their time, waste their time. And some people, uh, I, I think, need to stop putting hope in a savior, whether it's RFK, whether it's somebody else, whether it was Bernie Sanders, you know, and we were all there 
for Bernie Sanders. We all thought, hey, maybe perhaps this guy is going to break through and save us all. And in a way, you know, challenge the establishment with all his movement and look how that turned out. And we have, you know, Bernie Sanders still both citing the Israel uh, Palestinian issue, which is a genocide recognized by the majority of the world, except the United States and its proxies. So at the end of the day, I don't really think that RFK is a viable or serious candidate at this point. I think some Americans are under the illusion that he could be. I think especially because of the COVID, his challenging of the COVID uh, and what happened and the treatments and, and everything else because of that. I think some people only focused on that and ignored literally everything else, which I think is a fallacy. Um, but, you know, I, I honestly just, I think his candidacy really ended with the whole Shmuley thing and just hanging out with a rabbi and making a fool of himself. How is that being anti-imperialist when there's a genocide happening? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And in the same vein, uh, my next question was RFK Jr. was challenged by a debate by Dr. Joe Stein recently, but Mr. Kennedy chose to decline the debate and it's actually shared here by dr jill stein uh she says we heard from rfk jr's campaign manager he doesn't want to debate me on gaza seems he doesn't want to explain how he's anti-war while he supports israel committing genocide and start and trying to start a world war three on our dime uh so basically uh she said hey let's have a debate and he said no my question is, uh, what are your thoughts on him declining this? Because this looks really bad, yeah. at least to me. It's like she's calling him out and he said, yeah, nah. Yeah. Um, so I think that it was smart of her to try to debate him because this shows his hypocrisy. This shows that he's not really serious about going after the empire because he himself has been excluded from debates. So if he's actually trying to be this guy that's going to break the mold and actually offer people something different than what the Democrats or the Republicans are offering, he would walk the walk and actually have a debate with her and with anybody else that is challenging him. And the public would benefit from that because yeah. the public would see, OK, well, this is supposed to be an independent candidate that's going to be uh, an anti-imperialist of sorts. Right. And then you have Jill Stein, who is also an independent or a Green Party candidate. And she is obviously critical of uh, Israel. And this is what the difference of these candidates. And this is what we can see. But him saying no to that just basically shows that he is afraid of being challenged because he knows that he's going to look bad. And his whoever is managing his campaign at this point, to me, screams establishment based on everything we've seen um, from him. And he seems to me like at this point, controlled opposition um, and I think for a long time, that's what's unfortunately been the case. And um, I, I think we're going to uh, see more of that. We're going to see more of him just pivot. He has uh, also refused to really condemn Joe Biden to uh, the degree that's needed. He's actually refused to really talk negatively in a way, which I think people are past that point of political uh, politeness uh, and so-called decency when we have what's happening. We're on the brink of World War III. I am not exaggerating. We're on the brink of nuclear catastrophe. Our country is starting, uh, is trying to start a war with Russia via NATO, uh, threatening, uh, Europe is threatening to send actual troops. We have the uh, we have Israel attacking Iran's embassy, which is completely a violation of so many things, including the Vienna Convention, international law. And then we also have the ramping up against China. And so at any point in the world that that I just mentioned, you could see a potential escalation into a global conflict. And yet, you know, we don't have anybody there that's actually challenging to a degree uh, in in our pol in our political government and then you have the pot the potential th is really showing you that he's just all talk he's not really going to challenge the system
Yeah, I, I don't think so. And this actually leads into one of my next questions. And this is in regards to what's going on. Uh, the the I don't even want to say conflict. Uh, the, the, the massacre that's going on in Palestine right now is mm -hmm. Israel bombs all of Gaza and Rafah. More and more Americans are resisting the narrative that Israel is on the right side in regards to this issue. Has Israel lost the information war, in your opinion? Absolutely. And I think a lot of people would agree that Israel has lost the information war. Israel has lost the, uh, pers the public and the public's trust and perception. They will not recuperate from that thanks to social media, thanks to the fact that we are seeing videos from many Palestinians and people who have died, who have sent what has been happening, thanks to that. If it was 10 years ago, it wouldn't be the same because technology has developed in a way that has allowed us to see in real time what this ethnic cleansing, what this genocide is by the Zionist Israeli project. And what, what we're seeing, it cannot be unseen. The, the bodies of children, of infants, of women, of of everybody, of men as well as as especially young people. The fact that uh, Palestinians died trying to get flour, uh, that will never be forgotten. The fact that Al Shifa Hospital, a hospital, was bombed into oblivion. The actual incubator babies that were left and and have been found deceased, and and their bones that were left. The these stories are not just you know, stories that have been told by a third parties. We have seen them in the images every single day since October 7th. And we have also seen in a jarring way, the lies from the State Department, the protection of Israel by uh, Israelis and, and Zionists in the United States, their complete and total fabrication of lies in an attempt to try to make themselves the victims has completely is just entirely opposed in in a way that it it completely contradicts the reality so because of that people have lost trust in israel they have been questioning why our country is subservient to israel according to many people's beliefs i think our country gives israel the funding and i don't think israel would be what it is without our funding without our weapons but people have also started to say, well, why does Israel get better health care? Why does Israel uh, have the ability to, to have a better way of life than Americans do? And this is something that has made people question, why then is our money going there? Why is our money going to Ukraine? There's all of these things that people have been questioning. The fact that some a majority of our Congress has or a significant part of our Congress has dual citizenship with Israel and holds Israeli passports of a uh, state that isn't fully recognized by the by a lot of the community that is continuing to expand into the occupied West Bank, demolishing their homes and enacting apartheid on these people. And I just got back from the West Bank, and I really? got to interview people. Yeah, and and saw. Uh, what Israel is doing there. And the West Bank shouldn't be forgotten because that is another target for Israel. And there is a war going on there with the resistance fighting Israel uh, every single day and, and people getting killed just for existing and for trying to resist, basically. Um, and according to international law, Palestinians have the right to resist because Israel is an occupation. So the people that are breaking international law or the entity that is, it's Israel. And one more thing I want to say on that uh, topic is that Israel has also actually not won militarily. It hasn't uh, completed its objectives. The resistance, the axis of resistance, which consists of Ansarallah in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Iran, uh, and also the Palestinian aspect of the resistance that is beyond uh, just Hamas, there are 17 or at least other resistance factions, has continued to fight. Uh, Israel has destroyed their drones, their military equipment, and Israel has been unable to actually recuperate. They've lost many more men and troops that we have been hearing in the West. And the only thing that makes Israel look like they think like some sort of strong and mighty uh, intelligence power, uh, military intelligence power, is the fact that they've killed 33,000 plus uh, human beings 
mostly uh, defenseless women and children. And that is the only thing they're using to show, look, we demolished all of Gaza. Look, we demolished Al-Shifa Hospital. Look, we're bombing Rafah, the area where we told Palestinians to go for safety. And that is the only thing that they're using to show some sort of superiority, but that's not going to actually achieve their military objectives. In fact, Ansarallah has been destroying their ships and also American ships as well, and has been attacking them militarily and financially. Iran and Syria have also played a role, which is why you saw that attack on Iran's embassy in Syria. And of course, uh, that is something that Israel doesn't want people to know, that it's failed in its mission as well, militarily. Yeah, and just you know, to remind people of what's going on uh, at the border of the Red Sea uh, with the Houthis. The Houthis are actually also stopping without actually harming any of the crews on the ships and making sure that these ships do not go through the Red Sea in order to transport the goods and services to Israel. So it just goes to show that there's a lot of victories on the resistance front that a lot of people aren't talking about, that people like yourself and many people are talking about as well. Uh, people like yourself, you have people like Glenn Greenwald that are talking about it as well. Um, so that's what's been going on you know, as of recently. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, so so much is going on. Um, and, you know, and I don't mean to alarm people, but with uh, respect to what happened in uh, Syria, in Damascus and the bombing, I think there's there's going to be retaliation from Iran, as they have said. Um, and I don't think it's going to be, you know, civilian retaliation or embassies, but it is going to be retaliation against Israel. And again, the United States has told Iran not to do that, but Iran's going to defend its its own uh, borders, its own embassy, its own security. Israel has been attacking Syria, Iran, Palestine, uh, the West Bank, Gaza, uh, targeting Yemen as well. So Israel can go around the world attacking with impunity, as well as these uh, uh, world central kitchen uh, aid workers and other, by the way, om almost 200 aid workers before that that were mostly of Palestinian origin that the yeah. world didn't care about until Amer Americans and Australians died. By the way, the company owner is a raving Zionist and was praising Israel the entire time. So many have been saying that these workers were not even there on a humanitarian basis. We're, we're more so there as an intelligence uh, basis. Either way, their they're, they're killings, their sacrificing, at least uh, in that sense, is, is completely wrong and it's, it shouldn't have happened. But that's what we're seeing. And now all the aid that was going to Palestine, which was very small to begin with, has been stopped. And so at the end of the day, Palestinians continue to starve and um, Israel continues acting with impunity. Yeah, and it, it's it's ridiculous what's, you know, all the destruction that has been going on. Uh, and one of the things that I actually wanted to share was, you know, in regards to the information war, even corporate media is now starting to take a bit of a heel turn, if you notice. And this is something that I found very interesting on Morning Joe. This actually happened a few days ago. I'm not sure if you saw this. But it feels like Morning Joe even is forced to take a heel turn. Not that they actually want to. And they're still trying to keep the same State Department narrative, but they're tweaking it so that it's more in line with the general consensus of those of us who are against what's going on in Gaza. And let me just share this a little bit. Mr. Minister, about the number of civilian deaths among the Gazan population. Not only that, but the famine that now has taken place because Gaza is cut off. Again, no one contests what you're saying about Hamas. We say it every day on this show and have for a very long time, especially after the hideous attack of October 7th. But is Israel concerned about the human suffering inside Gaza, number one, and the number of civilian deaths that have been incurred since this attack began? We're concerned about 134 uh, hostages. Here's a picture of some of them. These girls are under tunnels for half a year, raped, tortured, this is what we're concerned about. We're concerned about those. By the way, there is no actual evidence that any yeah. sexual assault or torture has actually happened to them. This is a claim. This There has not been any substantial evidence that have been shown that that actually happened. So therefore, this is 
dare I say, at the very least, spin, but at the very worst, it is an outright lie. So just want to cover that there as well. Victims in Israel that were murdered, uh, slaughtered, little children that were put in the oven. Uh, that is also a fabrication and considered a lie because there has been no evidence that children have been put inside ovens. If anything, this guy is purely projecting. Just want to put yeah. that out there so that everybody knows exactly what is going on. All right, let's continue. Women that were raped and killed while they were raped. Projection. By terrorists, by jihadists. So we're concerned about those. How do we eliminate these folks? And by the way, they're funded. They're funded by Qatar and Iran. Yeah, they are. Yes, uh, Qatar they are. is a big enemy yes, of Israel. they are, Mr. Mayor. Mayor, can I ask you a question? I'm so glad you brought that up. So I have always looked at Hamas as Nazis. They're terrorists. Have you always looked at Hamas as Nazis? By the way, just for anybody watching, they also looked at somebody like Nelson Mandela as a terrorist. Yeah. And they don't look at the Azov Battalion as Nazis. They get awards. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's continue. Unfortunately, yes. And it was demonstrated you, October 7th what you, they do. Yeah. So, so you always have. Have most of the Israeli people always looked upon Hamas as Nazis? Well, you know, some of the people in Israel, because we seek peace, thought maybe one day they will prefer peace than war. October what about 7, Benjamin that, Netanyahu? That, that, what about Benjamin Netanyahu? What, what about him? Did, did, has he always looked upon Hamas as Nazis? Well, you're talking about Qatar or Hamas? Uh, um, he said Hamas. First. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is getting nervous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, Hamas. 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 I think Hamas. that everyone understands that Hamas's charter is to destroy Israel. And by the way, not so only Israel. So you've always known this. I mean, yeah, so we know the charter. Yes. So, so, so let me ask you this question. And I can't get an answer. And maybe, maybe we're just not covering it in the press. Maybe you can help me out. Why did Benjamin Netanyahu send the head of Mossad to Doha? three weeks before the worst attack on Jews since the Holocaust and told Qatar to continue funding Hamas. <laughs> I'm sorry, Fiorella. <laughs> it's just hilarious because it's just like, oh, there, here are these people it's like they can't necessarily say, well, you know, Hamas and then the other like 17 different resistance fighters, they're just resistance fighters. They have to say, oh, my God, they're horrible. But uh, uh, to be on the side of the people so they don't think that we're on the side of Israel. So why are they doing this? Uh, uh, why is Israel funding them? It's It's weird to me because it feels like, well, what you're sitting there saying that Israel's funding them, but at the same time, I don't know. Does it sound weird to you? It feels like they're, it's kind well, of like they're kind of skating on, they're riding the fence. Yeah, because so Hamas uh, was actually in the beginning, Israel did fund Hamas because they wanted to turn Hamas against uh, their other resistance factions. But then what ended up happening is that elements of Hamas decided not to do that. Um, and you have, you know, the Al-Aqsa uh, fight that has been going on, the Alexa flood and the operations from the other resistance factions. And so a lot of people uh, didn't really even like Hamas uh, to begin with because they did have that funding by Israel. So I don't know if he's getting to that part, if he's saying that, you know, so why did, why did Israel actually, yeah, fund Hamas to begin with? Um, and then of course their plan didn't work. Uh, their plan didn't work. They're not going to be honest about this, right? They're still saying like Hamas are Nazis, like, 
you know, they're, they're using all of this, but I think that's, that's part of what he's trying to do is try to say, well, if, if you think Hamas are Nazis and why did Israel fund them? And this is kind of interesting to see because he's putting this guy in the hot seat and he's clearly nervous and he's clearly uh, doesn't know how to answer this question because the guy's like, yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you, Joe. Right. He's like, I agree with you. I agree with you. But so why did Netanyahu fund Hamas? This is interesting because I'm surprised MSNBC is even going this route because this is usually the route the independent media has you know, brought up to question. Yeah. And let's just go to where this guy continues. Uh, you know, he kind of fumbles because. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I, it's kind of funny because it's just like, this is, is this the same channel? Let, let's go. I think if anything, October 7 shattered that concept. And, and it, it's my understanding. But you just said you always knew they were Nazis. I always knew they were Nazis. I would never give. I, we, we were always angry that Qatar funded Hezbollah and Hamas. I want to know, why did Benjamin Netanyahu do that? Let me ask you this. Why did Benjamin Netanyahu and Donald Trump know in 2018 the sources of Hamas's illicit funding and they still did nothing? They wanted that money to get to Hamas. I'd like to know why, because we don't know in America. Is, are, have there been any investigations in Israel at this point? I'm sure we'll investigate it, and I totally agree. I'm sure we'll investigate it. I'm sure. Fiorella, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. And and that goes. that's a 10-minute clip. He goes on just grilling him about why are you guys doing this if they're supposedly your enemy? And this makes me go back to how people like Osama bin Laden was actually trained by the CIA, and then he turns around and actually does what he does on 9-11 because of what the United States and Israel have been doing to Palestine. And in his letter to the United States, he actually states that we did this because of what you guys are doing to Palestine. Now, I'm not saying that we agree with what he did, because essentially what Osama bin Laden did was collective punishment, which we don't agree with. But at the same time, it's like we understand that his ire, his anger towards the United States turned because even though he was a tool at first, he switched sides. Yeah, which happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's just interesting how even Morning Joe has to kind of wrestle with the fact that the people in this country do not like what's going on. And so now they kind of have to ride that fence a little bit. Uh, and yeah. so there is um, something else I, I wanted to share as well. This actually came out earlier today, I think it was. Uh, shout out to the RBN uh, Orlando chapter. They actually shared this as well with me. But this is out of Spelman College. Uh, students in Spelman College are actually protesting against a Biden official. Will you follow for your boss, Butcher Biden, to stop arming Israel? There's no discussion. It's a yes or no. Will you help put an end to the genocide? Is it a genocide or a conflict? I just want to know. <laughs> because according to international law, there is a correct answer. Nobody should be sitting on stage with her while she's promoting genocide. She lacks moral courage. None of us here black world. Mm -hmm. You spoke about the involvement of the Israel lobby in the US politics, and now you're a part of it. <laughs> How do you feel about <laughs> gaslighting black students? Simply, just how do you feel gaslighting black students? And these are not just students, you have alums in the audience too watching you all. We call on all historically black college campuses to not allow us to be used. Even if our own professors want it to be used, we will not be complicit in genocide. The answer is simple. 
As a black woman that is walking the same alley that Alex Walker has walked, I could not stay silent during a genocide. Shame on you, both of you, your discussion for a result of this work. Shame on you, you are not a black folks that you should not have knowledge that was created for black safety. Calling security on your black students, huh? Shame! Shame! Were you on stage whispering about how you think hospitals are military targets? Or were you just key king because you don't care about human lives? Palestinians deserve better, black people deserve better, and Selma needs to do better. My sister cannot let them make a fool. And she finishes by saying, make them let them make a fool out of you. They did. They absolutely did. I love that. I love that. Good job, guys. Yeah. Whoever did and, that. Awesome. Well, that goes into basically what you were saying about how, and, and I just wanted to ask, what is the severity of the loss of the information war by Israel in, in your view? Well, it's, it's that, uh, it's going to build, it's going to get increasingly, um, more, uh, serious for Israel because Israel will not have the support, even of the once diplomatic powers. I just uh, earlier talked about this. The uh, Russian and, and Chinese uh, have been extremely diplomatic with Israel. Uh, they have advocated the 1967 borders with uh, from the UN charter, the uh, two-state solution. They have advocated that Israel, uh, it, you know, there should be an Israeli state and a Palestinian state. They uh, specifically Russia has remained the attempted neutral party to try to keep the region uh, in peace. Russia is a strong ally of Iran. Russia is a strong ally of Syria. Syria and Russia are fighting uh, against Al Qaeda factions in Syria right now. The Syrian Arab army is fighting these moderate rebels um, that were funded and supported by the United States. And uh, that is what what uh, that connection with Russia is a very substantial one. But simultaneously, you had a population a long time ago that's existed and continues today of Russian Jews. So you have uh, a lot of Russian Jews living in Israel. You have the fact that Russia is a multi-ethnic state that has uh, Jews, uh, uh, Muslims, the Chechens are the famously... Uh, known Muslims of Russia, and you have all of these different factions living in Russia. So what happens now, because Israel has become so entirely, uh, it can't help itself. In, in, in October 7th and what it's done to Gaza after that really destroyed Israel. It's, it's self-destroyed. Netanyahu is no longer popular with any of his constituents. They are, they are protesting him every single day and he's yeah. not popular with the rest of the world either. He's looked down as a demon that is, uh, actually doing genocide and killing innocents all over the, uh, all over Gaza. And you cannot have, uh, a relationship. Nobody's going to stand with that on, on an international level besides the United States who needs Israel and perhaps uh, the UK who also had, of course, create, helped create Israel and also in a way uses Israel. You're not going to have anybody else though besides those to actually stand with Israel. And so when you're looking at it from a diplomatic sense, this bombing of the Iranian embassy, which is, again, it's just, it hasn't happened. Uh, this is, these are countries it, like uh, China and Russia, they, they look at everything diplomatically, and this is something they cannot stand by. They have ardently criticized Israel, and you're going to see a shift in their relationship with Israel. Israel is becoming more isolated, more alone, and it's it's going to be, I think, isolated. Nobody's going to want to bring in Israel as some sort of actual legitimate entity when they're doing what they're doing. And it's going to become increasingly unpopular to do so. We see what Nicaragua is doing. Uh, again, we've seen what South Africa has done. We're going to see more and more. Of course, this is happening coming from the global south, right? Uh, Latin America, the, Af the continent of Africa, and and such because they have been, of course, on the uh, receiving end of Western hegemony and colonialism. So they understand exactly what Israel is. So, of course, they are going to be the ones leading this charge. But then you also have 
big superpowers like Russia and China that had a relationship with Israel, you're going to see that relationship shift. As Iran uh, and the situation with Iran heats up, they're, they're going to have to make a decision. And they're not going to side with the United States' biggest ally in Israel. They're going to have to make a decision. And you can see the alignments happening right now. If there was to be a world war, this is a world war that the United States and the West, including NATO, cannot win. We're talking about Iran's nuclear and military capabilities that far supersede um, much of what the U Europe has, including elements of the U.S. Russia has capabilities that far exceed what the United States has. China as well. You can't. There's no way. And this is not something I would want. But this is this is where we're headed because of the push by our own government, the the Pentagon, the State Department. They're pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, and. These countries, these people have been extremely, had a lot of restraint, if I do say so myself, uh, the way Russia was attacked in a terrorist attack, uh, the way that China's red lines were crossed with the United States doing military drills in ta with Taiwan. And and you're also seeing Iran. It, it's it's Qasem Soleimani was killed during the Trump administration in 2020. And now another general was killed and, and six others were killed. And they still, you know, they're still going to show restraint, but they're going to act. And I think what we're seeing is that both Israel and the United States as its main uh, funder are not going to be looked at the same again. And, and this is going to be also coming from the youth, the youth that has now learned what the Nakba was, the 1948 Nakba, and how it relates to now. The videos we have seen on TikTok and Instagram and everybody just saying, what the hell? We don't want to stand by this. We don't want our taxpayer dollars to go to this. Once you question something like this in, in your lifetime, once you find out what your government is capable of, you're going to start looking into everything else. And that's where we in independent media and in media have to go and continue providing this uh, knowledge and, and journalism and analysis and to make sure that this continues to become public knowledge. Because I think the people in the United States, we are the only ones that can actually help stop a, a global war of sorts, because it is from our own uh, country, our own government, that it, it's really coming from. You stop the funding to Israel, you end Israel. You, you really do. You stop the funding to Israel. Israel becomes essentially powerless. They will yeah. not be able to keep up. You stop the funding to Ukraine. The war in Ukraine ends. You stop the the engagements from the United States uh, on China and trying to stoke this war with China, uh, you know, wrapped up as, as, as this war against communism. Here we are again, you know, more than 70 years later, we're seeing the, the, the new the Cold War that never ended. And so you stop all of that. You you have peace. You have all of these other countries that want to cooperate. BRICS. You have this this idea of of existing cooperatively, of respecting people's sovereignty. You may disagree with how other countries conduct their affairs, but you discuss it diplomatically. That's a new paradigm that people are trying to go towards. That states, in especially in the East and Global South, are trying to go towards. But the United States and Israel essentially, and NATO stand in the way of that. And one side is is right now falling. And it's like a beast that is just latching on and it's trying so hard and desperately to continue to win uh, and to stay in power um, in, in a moment where it's, it's basically already lost. It, it's, it's not going to, we are not going to go back to the unilateral hold that the United States and NATO had. It's just not going to happen anymore. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and just to add one thing, I I personally wish that China was a little bit more forceful and as forceful yeah. Yeah. as, say, Nicaragua. Uh, yeah. There was a um, there was a move by the Irish Senate to uh, to also uh, sanction Israel uh, to. And then Julius Malema of South Africa wanted to pull want to close the, the embassy, the Israeli embassy, uh, just wanted them to pull away completely. I wish China was more forceful in that as well. That's just my opinion, though. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Yeah. 
Um, I do have a question that was proposed by a, a viewer. I, you know, I just want to preface this by saying, you know, I wouldn't have done it in all caps, <laughs> but uh, this person wanted to know uh, your thoughts about the attack of Ecuador to the Mexican embassy. I'm not exactly sure if you have already spoke about that, but uh, what is your thoughts? I'm not as up to speed on it as of yet as I should be, I but... Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly haven't um, been like super detailed about it, but what I do know, it is an entire violation of of the sovereign right of the Mexican people. And I think AMLO is correct in saying that this is absolutely ridiculous. And again, Israel has led the way. The United States has also uh, violated international law before. This isn't the first time. Um, we're talking about attacking embassies. The United States has led the way. Now Israel, of course, bombed an entire embassy. So now it's a free-for-all, right? We can just attack uh, diplomatic uh, areas, consulates that are supposed to yeah. be free of all of this. Right. And, and now it's, it's started this, this trend and I, it's completely awful and it shouldn't happen. And the uh, Mexican people have a right to be upset. They have a right to be pissed off. And this should be talked about uh, extensively at the UN. Although we know that the UN, in my opinion, is just completely needs entire reform or needs to be completely something else because all of these international organizations have shown their cowardice and have shown their inability to actually do what is needed in this time of urgency where we're talking about a genocide. We don't need is to give Israel a slap on the wrist. We don't need to give Israel 30 more days. We just need to give Israel, you know, uh, condemnation and they need to be economically and militarily restricted. When we talk about BDS, that's the only way to stop Israel. That, that really is uh, the only way you're not going to have, um, you know, anything else. And you're not going to have a two state solution. A lot of people act like this is the most, a uh, viable thing that this is realistic. It's actually unrealistic at this point to have a two-state solution. When you see the videos of Israelis of how they feel about Palestinians behind Netanyahu, there's so many, so many people that feel the same way and, um, and many worse than Netanyahu, if you can imagine that. And it's not going to change. This is like you go back to apartheid Africa. This isn't going to go away overnight. There needs to be a forceful uh, Palestinian state established that exists with both people that is that is not allowed, uh, is going to allow Israel to expand. Because Israel has said they are going to expand into Jordan, into Lebanon, into Syria. They want all of this territory. And they have been honest about them wanting. They think it's their... God given right to do so. It's this yeah. Zionist idea that they're using to, to expand. And um, when I was in the West Bank, um, that is one of the things they are doing. And um, th that is something that's not going to stop. There's also thousands of Palestinians in Israeli prison, including children, and they don't get trials. They're not given anything. And they also don't get slogans like release the hostages because they're posed as being terrorists for resisting the uh, Zionist uh, entity. So again, the, what we're talking about here is a lack of respect to national sovereignty, a lack of respect yeah. to people who who are are you know basically trying to run their own affairs. And on that note, I will say that I will be following the Mexican election coming up because uh, AMLO will be leaving. And uh, it is a scary time because he will not be, there's a limit in Mexico. And so he will, he didn't change anything uh, in terms of that. So he will not be reelected uh, this time around. So there will be another president. And that is a potentially uh, dangerous election because the United States, of course, has been very uh, uh just vindictive when it comes to Mexico, trying to say that the cartels are all just coming from Mexico and trying to impose itself on Mexico's affairs. Also, the economies are severely tied. So that'll be an election as well to look at. And I also, in respect to what just happened in Ecuador, that'll be something also to look into. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for answering that question. And, and I just wanted to ask as far as, because I know you're on RT, uh, you have a lot of irons in the fire that are going on right now. 
Yeah. Is there anything new that's going on with you that you're excited? Any new projects that are going on with you, with you that we need to be uh, up to speed about? Yeah, so I will be doing a few new projects and I'll inform people when I, I have that. But right now I have a new channel called Fiorella in Moscow where I'm putting up uh, new content, new interviews, and also about Russia and life in Russia as well. Um, and I also uh, just went to the West Bank. I have some interviews that I'll be releasing this week and next week um, with interviews from mothers who have children in prison who have been sentenced there for at least five years. They keep uh, just, there's no reason. They just, they don't have a trial. They keep pushing it back. There's also a mother who lost her son who was a resistance fighter. And I went to the site where um, Shireen Abu Akhle was murdered as well. And uh, that that's uh, in Janine, uh, in the in the occupied West Bank. And I uh, talked to these people there. I also talked to some refugees from Gaza that are in the West Bank and what their fears are. So be lo be looking out for these interviews and um, you know, subsequent perhaps articles on on this as well. And um, I also recently went to Lugansk uh, in the Donbass. Uh, and I will have more information on that as I'll be returning very soon. So there's a lot going on. Be uh, sure to check out my uh, Twitter and also my um, YouTube as well. Today I interviewed Vanessa Beely and Eva Bartlett, and they were uh, they have both lived in Syria and Gaza, and uh, know extensively about the region. So yeah, just be sure to check that out. Oh, sucky sucky! Now I'm excited for you. Good to see that. I'm so happy for you. And Thank also, you. yeah, it's great because the thing is, I think that a lot of people need to see more of this perspective uh, outside of just the, the Western narrative. And you've been doing very really well in this and, and, and pushing this out. But I think also showing that, oh, uh, this is what life really like is in places like Moscow, or this is what's going on in the West Bank. I think that's important, especially, you know, when people like us say, yeah, there's apartheid that's going on there. And people are like, there's no apartheid. Like Michael Rappaport goes, where's the apartheid at? And you're like, ha, ha, here it is. There it is right there. I think that's so important. Yeah, it's it's important. A lot of people just don't know. And that's what we try to do is to inform them, you know, that this th what you've been told is the lie. And it's hard to tell people that that they've been lied to. So, uh, yeah, but that's why we need programs like yours and others. And um, thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you so much. And just let everybody know, uh, I'm going to share with you guys Fiorella's uh, Twitter account. If you guys would like to, you guys can also follow her there. She uh, also puts out really great content, really great breaking stories. Uh, I try to share whenever I can. Of course, you know, we get throttled on Twitter too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Twitter the beast. Like Elon likes to talk about how he's a free speech, spe free speech absolutist. But yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> the call is coming, coming inside the house, Elon. So, but yeah, so yeah, no. that's what they can find you there as well as you're on RT, correct? Yeah, I'm on RT as well. But um, right now I'm, I'm really focused on my uh, projects and my work. So I'll be looking out for a lot of online stuff as well. All right. Thank you so much for joining. It was such a pleasure to have you again. And, you know, you. I learned a lot from you. And so I felt like I was a student, you know, and you were a <laughs> professor just giving me knowledge about what's going on in the world. And I just, I'm humbled and thank you so much. Thank you. And I appreciate your attention to the domestic issues too, because those are important and directly affected, of course, by our foreign policy. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. I'll see you again soon. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. So that was a wonderful interview uh got a lot of knowledge and so it that this is one of the reasons why i wanted to have her on because when it comes to especially a lot of foreign policy uh she has a lot of uh, heavy is the head that wears the crown so she has that crown uh, of knowledge that really just scopes about what's going on in the world and you know uh all politics is local so whatever's happening abroad especially what the west is doing i think it's important that we stay focused on that too so with that being said 
Did you like the stream? Go ahead and give the stream a like. That pushes me out into the algorithm. And I just want to thank you guys so very much. And we'll get into the chat right now. So, well, before we get into the chat, let's do some house. All right. So, with that being said, I just like to give a shout out and a thank you to all the patrons on Patreon and Coffee. Without you guys, I would not be able to do this work. You guys make this possible. So, if you guys would like to, you guys can go to my Patreon. That is linked in the description. It's also at the top of the chat if you guys would like to. And yes, I am demonetized. So, if you guys would like to support the channel, you can support either via Patreon or paypal so thank you so very much now in addition to and furthermore if you guys have not already you guys can also see what you're getting into make an informed decision so you guys can go to my patreon and choose whatever tiers that you like all right so what do we have we have we have all right come on work now we have jb members solidarity comrades jb Fonters. Super JB Fonters, Super Duba JB Fonters, and Mega JB Fonters here. And I just want to give a shout out to new patrons that we have so far. Uh, I would like ugh, JB, get it together. Thank you so much to future new patrons as of right now. Any new patrons that come in while I'm streaming, I wait. Is that a new patron already, or is that a? I could have swore. You know what? I'll do it right now. Why not? Why not? All right. Thanks to new patron, Ingy Stardust. <laughs> Just saw it. So I was like, oh, okay. All right. So thank you so very much for becoming a new patron as well. Now, let's get to the chat. Let's let let's have this conversation. Plus, I want to get to I want to get to the poll that I did at the beginning because I think that's really important as well. But I'm going to go to the Rockfin first, because I think that's important, too. A lot of people have some things to say for the first segment, too. I know y'all got some things to say. Okay. So let's go here. Uh, good to see you. Anna Mare says, we like we like you just, oh, thank you so much. Like me just the way I am. Says, no wonder why it costs $35 to make peanut butter sandwich in Alaska. $35. Good Lord. All right. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so very much. All right. So I have a couple of comments started as well. Uh, Lisa Yoder says, your poll answer, I do not see how anyone that is not independently wealthy can know to retire at 65 or 70 or 75. The way things double in price every year or so no one could know that's actually a really good point because a lot of times people like people like some of us are like well i hope i'll be able to retire at 65 but then at this moment we're just like uh i don't think i can because if the price is going the way it is i'll never be able to retire so that's the fear that a lot of us are actually having katie lewis says i told some America is the greatest country on earth, people, that both Russia and China have governments with over 80% approval ratings, and they cope by saying their populations are propagandized. Well, ain't that the toilet calling the, I'm sorry, ain't that the chamber pot calling the toilet white? You guys want to call China and Russia propagandized, meanwhile, from the ages of four or five up until we graduate high school, you have to pledge allegiance to a flag every single day, five days a week in the mornings. And you want to talk about them being propagandized. What? Baby, 
My goodness. Interesting. Jacqueline says, in the U.S. and U.K., we seem to be under a form of corporate politics masquerading as electoral politics. Yes. Because a lot, you know, interesting, a lot of people will say, a lot of people will talk about, oh, my God, you actually want the government to see, for to oversee, you can say healthcare, you can say housing, you can say education, and blah, blah, blah. People will talk about, oh, my God, you want the government. And the thing is, it's like, it's not the government that you actually hate. It's the corporations that are actually puppeting the government that you actually hate. It's like being in a car. And let's say you have this car, let, let, let's call it a, a Honda Civic, right? And you have this red Honda Civic that's being driven. And it's like, well, you want that red Honda Civic to be driven? You want that? You you want to ride in that red Honda Civic? Oh no! Why would you want to ride in it? But it depends on who's behind the wheel. Is it a corporation that's behind the wheel that's driving that red Honda Civic, or what about one of us workers driving the red Honda Civic? Because that Honda Civic can either ride on this muddy road that is hard to get through, or it can ride on that smooth, paved way. But if they don't want you to get to your destination that quickly, they'll drive onto the muddy road. So, oh, see, sorry, but it's going to take us a long time to get in this destination. You might have to get out and walk. Whereas if it was actually being driven, by workers, we will go on that smooth road and go, oh, we're going to be there in five minutes, baby. Just, just sit tight. The problem isn't government. The problem is who is behind it. Everybody who talks about demonizing government are actually demonizing the capitalists that actually run the government. Your problem isn't government in itself. Your problem is the people who run it and the people who fund the people who run it, which means who are the ones that are bribing the politicians? And don't give me that, oh, it's just crony capitalism. It's not capitalism, baby. You can say that it's crony capitalism, but who is the ones that are actually funding it? Are it not the capitalists? Are it not the people who own our corporations? Are it not those people? Are they not the capitalists? It's definitely not the socialists. It's definitely not the communists, because if, if that was the case, then COINTELPRO would have never existed. The McCarthy era would have never existed. This Cold War would still not be going on. When people are like, oh my God, they're communists running the country. <laughs> I wish. It's not. So, yeah. Also, by the way, if you're new watching this and if you hate communism, most likely because you just don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> Talk to an actual communist before you demonize something. And yes, we know what capitalism is like because we live in it. Anyway, so yeah. But thank you very much for that comment, Jacqueline. Why in the world? Man. Whew. This sniffles really got me. All right. So let's go to a, a, a few more comments. Kay said, oh, these people just say the most Hanish-ish they can think of. Look, by the way, also, when people talk about the, the charter from Hamas, the Hamas charter doesn't say anything about uh, getting rid of Jewish people. I read the 2017 Hamas charter. It says nothing about getting rid of Jewish people. Now, 
it says getting rid of the Zionist entity that is Israel that is illegally occupying the land that they have been on for generations. Here's something that a lot of people don't consider. Palestinians have always been cool with Jewish people living among them. Because they have. problem is stealing the land that they have been living on. That's like that's like you and me being roommates. And we've been roommates for a long time. And there's a couple of extra rooms in that house. And then a couple of your family members want to move in. Alright, cool. We got some extra rooms in the house. You know, we can live side by side. Cool, I'm fine with it. But don't have one of your family members come into the house and kick me out of my room. And then say, well, it's been ours for this long. No, baby. I've been here for, for forever. Why are you kicking me out of my room? That's what I don't agree with. That's what's going on right now. It was never about being against Jewish people. It was about being against Zionism, which means taking away the land that they have been living on for centuries and then replacing it with other people. That's what's not cool. Land theft is not cool. If you want to live among the Palestinians and live there and maybe say buy land, buy the house from the Palestinian, if they want to move out or whatever, cool, fine, go ahead. But don't take what doesn't belong to you. That's the issue. So it was never about Jewish people. Zionism is a political ideology, not a religion, not an ethnic group. Biden is a Zionist. He is not at all Israeli. He is not at all Jewish. Biden is a Zionist. Trump is a Zionist. Right? Richie Torres is a Zionist. Hakeem Jeffries is a Zionist. Nancy Pelosi is a Zionist. Nothing close to being Jewish. Most Zionists are actually Christian. So let's just get that out of the way. So I just wanted to place that there too. So thank you so very much. Dwayne Vogel says they have to make up atrocities because they need to distract from the fact that they commit atrocities daily. That's true. That is true. EMK says they got a recording of BB scene that part about the funding of Hamas. Wow. Interesting. Katie, <laughs> I'm sure we'll get around to maybe considering the meeting to determine whether we'll look into it or not. It sounds like the United States government, don't it? Especially when it comes to reparations. Zavi Benjamin says, I don't think the U.S. has appreciated some AMLO's Stances for sure. Yeah, especially the one about, uh, you know, making the, making, I think it was the lithium mines public. Was it lithium? I think it was. Because I think they have lithium mines in Mexico. But the United States wants that to be privatized so that they can get it for cheap. But they don't like that. Grant Scarborough says, stopping by for a brief kit. Are you related to Joe Scarborough? Tell him I said what's up. <laughs> yeah, Lino says they always say Zionists. Yeah, in, in, in the Hamas charter, it says Zionists. It doesn't say Jews. It doesn't say Jewish. See, that's the thing a lot of people don't realize. But that's the thing. You have to actually read the charter. See, a lot of people will believe what somebody says without actually having to read it themselves. Read it yourself. It doesn't say anything about Jewish people in that way. But this is why you have to 
you know. Read it. And on top of it, they're just against the land theft. And do an occupied people have the right to resist? Answer that question. And if you realize that an occupied people have the right to resist, then guess what? Technically, technically and legally, what happened on October 7th was actually a legal thing. And that's something that a lot of people don't want to contend with. That what happened was actually legal. And they went after military targets. Yeah. And some people who may be friends of mine or maybe former friends of mine, they come into this and go, oh, my God, I can't believe you're siding with them. It's like, I am with the people who are oppressed. And if you are illegally occupying a people, you're wrong. And then some people will go, well, do you think the United States should give back the land that they stole from the natives? Yes! I wish, I wish y'all gave the land back to the, the Sioux and the Okoes and the Seminoles and all these different nations that you that the West, the Europeans stole from. I wish. Let them determine what we have. All right, cool. It wasn't yours to begin with. Let the stewards of the land actually make that determination. All right. People look at me and go, oh, my God, you're not native to this land. What are you doing here? <laughs> Your ancestors stole my, my people's ass and brought us over here in the first place. So guess what? I'm still here looking at you like this. We'll go back to Africa. We'll pay me my reparations and I'll get the hell on. But then you, you, but then you don't want to pay us the reparations. Because you know, like, well, we didn't do it. Well, you, you, some, some of y'all, your ancestors did. All we're asking is that the United States government does it. And remember that the United States government could do it because guess what? Back in March of 2020, when they took $4 trillion, $4 trillion, trillion with a T, trillion, T as in Tom, T as in Mr. T, and gave $4 trillion and dumped it into the markets. If you don't think that they can't do that, what makes you think? If they can do that, then they can give us our reparations, baby. $4 trillion, they can do that for 10 years. And boom, reparations paid. Instead of giving all this money to Israel, y'all just give us our reparations and we get on. By the way, Even still, there's a lot of people who, you know, who are still suffering right now because the United States is continuing its assault and the global south, especially in many countries, you know. Guatemala, Ecuador, El Salvador, whatever. It's crazy. You know, it's something I, I, I wanted to read. And with ha after talking about the first segment and then talking to Fiorella Isabel, I wrote something down, and I don't know when I wrote this down. This was a while ago. I was cleaning out stuff because, you know, of course, I'm in a housing crisis right now, and I had to go through stuff to throw away and stuff to give away and blah, 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 yakety schmackety. But I, I, I wrote, I wrote this while I was still deeply religious. And it's kind of interesting how I wrote this when I was younger, deeply religious, and it actually kind of 
it kind of my my politics and my beliefs really didn't change all that much. It just got sharper. So I I, I wrote this a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But I found this interesting. Here's what I wrote years ago. I said, we have the brains, know-how, and feasibility to create a new civilization. Motivated by incompetence, and then it says, our civilization now is motivated by incompetence of governments. I would say to my past self that wrote this, I would say it's not incompetence. It's actually competence. It's greed. That's what I would say. To, I would correct myself. Says humans in human nature plus technology coexist peacefully. So human nature and technology can coexist peacefully. War, poverty, debt, and unnecessary human suffering is avoidable and unacceptable. It will result in the same problems we face today. This is what I read years ago. I wrote years ago. Merely complaining without it possesses an alternative. I'm oh, sorry. Merely complaining without posing an alternative offers nothing. So this is why I think it's important for those of us who are in independent media to pose alternatives, right? To say, okay, this is what's going on now, but here is a possible viable solution in order to change things. Because we can complain all day, but the goal for you watching this channel or for any other channel or for reading any other article isn't to make you walk away depressed, isn't to make you walk away hopeless, is to inform you what's going on, but say, okay, here, here's another option. And here's the steps that you can take in order to be able to do something different. Now, if you guys go back a couple of weeks back on RBN, uh, it was me, Savvy Sabs, uh, Colin from Any News Network, Afini as well. Was there anybody else that was with us? I can't remember any. I don't think anybody else was with us. But we all talked about doing more on the ground work, on the ground organizing. How do you get that going? Who leads the on the ground organizing? And we talked about all this on RBN, on the Savvy and JB show a couple weeks back. But it's it's information like that that will help people in order to do more on the ground work so that we can change, build mutual aid, build dual power, things like this. So that our elderly folks don't have to, if they do have to go back into work and they don't have to work out that many hours. Or if we want to stop the genocide that's going on in places like Gaza, uh, in Congo, Sudan, Haiti, what have you, we can do more on the ground work to take the power away from the people who are pushing uh, the the narrative and the and the will of these corporate dictators, right? I think that's one of the things that we have to do. I think that's what's important about a lot of us who are in independent media. We actually have a duty to not just inform, but to also encourage to go a different route. Don't just complain. Don't just talk about the problems. What can we do to assist our people who are watching us to move further forward? Because I don't want you to walk away being depressed. I want you to be fortified and say, okay, I know what the issue is. Here's a possible solution. Let me get my behind out into the streets and let's do this thing to make things better. Because, because you're technically offered solutions by the humanist report, uh, you're offered solution. You're offered a solution by, uh, oh my gosh, breaking points. You're offered a solution by Kyle Kalinsky. You're offered a solution by TYT. But their solution is just go out and vote. Just vote. And we, you and I, both know that that's not a completely viable solution. And I'm not insulting them, but I'm saying that they, for them, they're going by the same recipe book that was given to us by the people who destroyed the institutions of mutual aid and dual power. Because the people who destroyed our institutions of mutual aid and dual power, they also told us, oh, just go ahead and vote. Just go out there and vote. When in reality, if that was the case, if that meant that things would drastically change, voting would also be illegal. 
they would have took that away a long time ago. And even still, they also place barriers in there. Because this is why we can't, we, it's so hard for people like Dr. Jill Stein, Dr. Cornell West, Claudia De La Cruz, Jasmine Sherman, all these different people to actually get on the ballot and run a third party candidacy. So they even place barriers there, even though it's not as effective as we would like for it to be. So you have some of these channels that say, well, we just need to vote in or vote in for the lesser of two evils. When in reality, our focus needs to shift. We have to use our shiver legs and pound that pavement. And I'm not talking in signing the people to register to vote. No, I'm talking about building dual power. Now, if you want to go kind of parallel to the electoral route, then try doing direct democracy when it comes to ballot initiatives. That is even more powerful, right? So that's a route. Also, tenants unions, right? Organizations, for instance, I I, I, and I brought and bring them up. You know, Nick from RBN, he has KC tenants out there in Kansas City. Here in Orlando, you have Real Orlando, Revolutionary Education Action League. They actually do work out here. You also have the People's Free Kitchen that actually, they also have a farm where they're growing food and then feeding the unhoused in our perspective poorer areas. So they're actually doing the work on the ground. You can do the same things in your perspective cities. And if they don't exist, start them. Get together with your, get together with your homies and start doing stuff on the ground. That's what it is. Because the thing is that we can talk about the problems all we want to, but if we're not providing solutions, then we're just bumps on the law. You can't, look, come here. You can do this. If I, on kidney dialysis, can do something, you can do something. It doesn't mean that you have to do to the degree that I do. As a disabled person, I have my limitations. You also have your limitations and pay attention to those. But do something. When I say leave the world better than you found it, that is an action. That's not an aspiration. That is an action. And that's what I try to push people to do. Actively do something to leave somebody's world a little bit better. I'm not just ta- giving you guys the stories just to inform you. Of course, I am doing it to inform you. Knowledge is power. But I'm also doing this because I want to encourage you to do more within yourself. So that even if you expire one day, the world is better because of the actions you took today. That's what I'm here for. And for some of us, just waking up is all we can do. And at those times, open your eyes, take a deep breath, and just be grateful because we're grateful that you're still here. So, yeah, um, I don't know why I went into that rant, but, but yeah. I also said years ago, we have been brought up to fear that which is new. Most wars are for obtaining resources and maintaining the differential advantage, not based on the dignity of man or God. I said that over 100,000 companies feed at the Pentagon trough, but the big money goes to a handful of huge corporations. I said this years ago while I was deeply in religion. It says among our GE, 
Boeing and Lockheed Martin, Halliburton and Honeywell. Putting profit is a source of suffering today. I was a Jehovah's Witness saying to writing this stuff down. I was taking notes at a, I think I was, I was at an assembly or a convention taking notes. Human behavior is determined by the environment in scarcity. As Jehovah's Witnesses, we were taught that uh, you don't trust the government. That's one thing that we were taught. That's one thing I do take away. Says there's only a policeman in front of something people have a need for. What? There is only a policeman in front of something people have a need for. If you had plenty for everyone, money would not come into existence or private property. Plan obsolescence, the constant withdrawal of efficiency. Innov I'm say innovators make products that wear out right on schedule. This results in tremendous waste of resources and energy. We are plundering the planet for profits. This isn't a job people want, but access to what a paycheck will bring. Money does not represent anything real. There's no gold, silver, or resource to back it up. You can't eat money or build a house with it. We're moving towards social collapse. I wrote this years ago, baby. The federal government is not allowed to make or print money or lend money. They have to borrow money from private lending institution public as to pay off the debt. We cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. That was from Albert Einstein. Resource-based economy. All goods and services are available without the use of money, barter, credit, debit, or servitude of any kind. With abundance, you eliminate greed. I think if you pledge allegiance to the earth, any and everyone on it, that be the way to go for the future. No more separate nations. To end war, you must declare the earth common heritage. The more diverse people are, the more individuality. The more you know, the more alive you are. You don't have to worry about making a living in the making a living. The incentive is boosted. It is not monetary oriented. It's problem solving oriented. You get a kick out of seeing the world become a better place. It is not automobile technologies that we should be wary of. I'm oh, sorry. It, should, it is not automotive technologies we should be wary of, but the misuse of it. People want access to things when they want it. When they have access, they will not want to store or accumulate things. People will be able to check things out like a library, like a camera, bicycle, or wristwatch. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. It is crazy, man. But yeah, so I wrote that years ago when I was still deep in my religious beliefs. And... Uh, I've only sharpened since then. And so this stuff is deeply in my heart already. And so I appreciate some of that lessons that I was taught that it just reinforced what I believed. So, yes, uh, I will be getting into the readings further later this week. Uh, last week, I read uh, The Will to Change. Uh, actually, it was Sunday. So I read The Will to Change. I finished up on chapter three. So if you guys would like to, I did that. That one was cathartic. If you are a man, by man I say, I mean cisgender male. If you are a man, that ending of chapter three, go ahead and watch it. When I did that reading, just go into the playlist tab and go to The Will to Change. It's the latest one. Woo! Ooh! That one was cathartic because it makes us realize, oh, man, we're pushed to be a oh, man, manly man by the capitalist system. Like, we can't just be naturally who we are. They want us to take our humanity away. Oh, Bell Hooks gets it. Go ahead and read that. And then uh, later this week, I'll also get continue to reading. 
and uh, the of Water and the Spirit by Melodoma Patrice Somme. I'll be continuing that reading as well. And also, I uh, will be continuing in the reading of Laziness Does Not Exist by Dr. Devon Price. I think I'm about to start in Chapter 8, but it's really, really good. Um, yeah, I'll be, I'll, I'll be finishing Chapter 7. So we'll be getting into that as well. That, that was just amazing. Uh, I, I, I'm loving reading these books. I'm just growing, and I'm just really loving it. And I love that you guys join me on this, too. Because as I grow, I get to tell the audience, you know, what I'm learning, how I'm growing too. It's just, it's just an amazing uh, relationship that we have. And I'm so glad that you guys are here with me on this ride. It's just a beautiful thing. Let me go into the Rockfin because I think Roger said that he's, I should go into Rockfin. Uh, Roger, uh, oh, first off, let me go. Ooh. Okay, so thank you for the tip on Rockman. Roger says, Houston, Fee got a problem. Kidding, but I disagree with the last thing she said, which was domestic policy is directly affected by our foreign policy. Sorry, Fee, but our foreign policy is directly affected by our domestic policy. We invade, do sanctions, and run coups at the behest of American shareholder corporate interests. Destroy their foundation here, replace with replacing with worker co-ops and public banks using CBI sits about initiatives and then watch foreign policy improve. That is yes. Uh, yeah. It's like basically, you know, one hand, you know, uh, shakes hands with the other one feeds one another. I think. Yeah. Uh, good to see you, Dave Burt. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, Yes, I appreciate it. Self-derived philosophical insights. Thank you so very much for that, Dave Burt, as well. So, yeah, uh, I'm going to head out. I uh, just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody for tuning in. This was a wonderful, wonderful stream, and I will be making sure to get to the clips as soon as possible. So thank you very much. And also, just to let you guys know, I also do shorts as much as I possibly can now. Uh, these also help too. So if you guys, you know, come across a short, you know, uh, you know, if you like what I say in the short, be sure to leave a like, you know, that also helps me out in the algorithm too. I really appreciate it. And then also if you guys have any thoughts, make sure to, you know, let me know and thoughts in the comments too, because I think that also helps too. Oh, by the way, I forgot. I need to see the, the, the poll. The poll, the poll, the poll. The poll, the poll. Let's get on this poll. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me shut up. Let me stop. I'm so silly. Even though I'm under the weather. I'm... Oh, my goodness. I just said it. Okay. Cool. So let me. Okay. Ooh, good, good amount of people voted. All right. So. Let's check the poll. Share the screen real quick. All right. All right. So do you think you'll be able to retire by 65 and stay retired? 12% said yes. 65% said no. And 22% said unsure. This is why we got to change the system so we can retire. I'm sick and tired of this. I, I do not like. Look. I'm about to turn 40 in a couple months. I want to be able to at least say I'm look. Oh, by the way, I wanted to say this too. Before I before I head on out, because I got I got I got something to say about I think the retirement age should go down. There is no reason why we should. And people will go, well, we get to live longer. Yeah, exactly. And on top of it, we should not have to work as much. I think that you should be able to live. Not working day in and day out just to make somebody else richer. No. In fact, I think our retirement age should go down. 
in the interim, we should lower it to 60. We need to get rid of 401ks and bring back pensions. And Medicare should cover 100% of costs. And we should lower Medicare at the start to 50. That's right. I said 50. And pay 100%. Now, that's me being, that's me pulling back on my communist belief. Now, the real JB, I say, nah. We need to give health care for everybody. Nationalized health care system. But for anybody that's running, if you're trying to stay measured, no, nah, go, 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 go. Look, if they call you a communist, oh, well, so what? Who cares? Now. I do think that we should have a nationalized healthcare system. We need to go that route now. We should have went there yesterday. We need to have public housing. Man, let me get out of here. Because I'm about to get on another another soapbox, and I'm about to start preaching to y'all until the cows come home. Y'all can be hearing, by the time I'm done. Anyways. I'm hungry, too. I need to eat. That smoothie went straight through me. Anywho, I just want to thank all of you guys for coming in. And uh, by the way, I am still in need of some assistance when it comes to housing. Uh, if you guys would like to, you guys go to the PayPal. That's in the description. If you guys would like to, you guys can go to the Cash App. Uh, I'll put that in the description. I'll put that in the chat as well. If you guys would like to, uh, or if you guys would like to, I'll put my memo in the chat as well, too. If you guys would like to assist with that, uh, regards to housing, I'm still trying to go through that. Uh, but yeah, uh, I have until May 31st to find a place and leave. So because they're selling the property. So, and they sprung it on us like two weeks ago. Well, no, about a week and a half ago. So, yeah. But anyways, so I want to say thank you so very much to Fiorella Isabel uh, for joining. I cannot wait to have her back on. She was an amazing guest. Like I always say, water your plants, water yourselves, leave the world better than you found it. Smoke them if you got them, drink them if you got them. If you ain't got them, then watch something funny. because Watch something hilarious because joy is revolutionary, right? Um, and just be be vigilant in what's going on do not allow them to okay be vigilant and just do whatever you can you know as far as trying to fight for the people you know i know we talk about palestinians but this is also tied to the congolese do not stop talking about what's going on in congo do not stop what's talking about what's going on in sudan uh, talk about what's going on in Tigray. I gotta, I gotta, you know, uh, get up to speed on that. Uh, don't stop talking about what's going on in Haiti. Don't stop talking about what's going on in these countries, and always tie it back to our liberation is their liberation. Their liberation is our liberation. We gotta change things here in order to help them abroad. So keep that up, and uh, yeah. Oh, bye, silly me. Mwah. Forehead kisses to every single one of you. I'm going to leave you guys with a, a video and then pieces, Reese's pieces to you guys. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a wonderful evening. And of course, free Palestine. Deuces, Bruces. Home in Palestine. Nancy Pelosi, you are complicit in genocide. The blood of over 15,000 Palestinian babies is on your hands. How can you be a Democrat and say you hold democratic values while over 100,000 innocent Palestinian civilians have been massacred with bombs okay. that you All paid right. for? 
We will not be shamed into voting for you or Genocide Joe and your massacre policy. My family back home in Palestine is being killed. Their blood is on your hands. And David Axelrod, shame on you and every one of the Democratic elite that want to shame us for voting for Genocide Joe. 80% of Democrats support a ceasefire. Shame on you. Shame on you. Nancy Pelosi, you are complicit in genocide. The blood of over 15,000 Palestinian babies is on your hands. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. More head kisses and have a beautiful day.